part of the component that would need to be part of the equation would be fun. How do you make me have fun? We spend a little bit of time, particularly initially, just doing some fun games. You know, don't drop the baby. Where one person is holding a ball and the other person is not. So you're playing volleyball. The person who's contacting the ball has to get rid of the ball they're holding. While the serve was coming to me, I'd have to flip it to you. You would catch it. I passed to you. You would flip it to me while you go in to set. And then I flip it back to you when I attack. And the other side is doing the same thing. The Better at Beach Volleyball podcast. My name is Mark Burrick, and here at Better at Beach, we talk about, do, and teach everything that has to do with beach volleyball. So, whether you're a player, a coach, or somebody who just absolutely loves the sport, hopefully, we have something for you. We run classes, lessons, clinics, camps, online courses, and online coaching, and we are also developing a coaches mastermind group which we'll see if we can convince today's guest to get into and lead the way but we also have seven day training vacations and if you're watching this live right now this is june 21st we just released our first camp date for the fall we are going to the postcard inn in saint pete beach florida for seven days of training volleyball tournaments parties hanging with pros and awesome coaches and new friends. So if you want to sign up for that right now and you're watching live, there is one more day. It looks like about 28 more hours of early bird pricing where you can save money. So just head on to betteratbeach.com forward slash camps if you want to check that out. On to today's guest. We will read his bio and we'll see if you can guess by the time we get to the end of his laundry list of accomplishments here. So he set an NCAA record with 45 matches with 10 plus digs at USC and graduated in exercise science. My brother. He was a standout athlete at the University of Southern California and led the program's all-time record in digs, tallying 956, a record that stood for 10 years. Before joining the coaching staff at Rice, he spent 11 years at Baytown Christian Academy in Texas as the school's athletic director and operations manager. Prior to joining LSU, he spent eight seasons with the indoor volleyball program at Rice University and served as a volunteer coach from 2006 to 2008 before being promoted to assistant coach in 2009. He has helped six players to the CCSA All-Freshman team for the entirety of his tenure, LSU, Louisiana State University, has been ranked inside the ABCA top 10 and the Tigers have earned 24 top 10 victories with him at the helm. In each of his first three seasons as head coach, he has led LSU to the NCAA championship as one of the final eight teams in the nation at Gulf Shores and National Championships. And by 2020, Brock, we got his name, <laughs> had built the Louisiana State University beach volleyball program into a national powerhouse. And the Tigers carried a number two ranking into the season. And in his first four seasons as LSU's head beach volleyball coach, Russell Brock has led the Tigers into national prominence. So without further ado, Coach Brock, Russell, thank you so much for joining us and teaching us and sharing your wisdom. Uh, my pleasure. That's that's a pretty impressive bio. Uh, I think I learned a few things myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, you put it together. So there we go. <laughs> nice little pat on your own back there. Yeah. Love my defenders. So talk to me first about dig records at USC. Were you playing libero? Were you just a defensive specialist or did you have the easy job of like an opposite or a setter just picking up everybody's tips? Yeah. So we got to go way back. This is a historical uh, conversation because there were no liberos whenever I played. Mm -hmm. I genuinely think probably that would have been my calling. I mean, I was a 6'3 outside, 6 rotation. My ability to stay on the floor really, at least in the initial phases, began because I was a great ball control player. And you know, you, there weren't many subs allowed. There was no libero. Like You couldn't make those adjustments. You had to have you know, enough people on the floor who were primary passers. And typically, you know, me and one other guy covered the floor. And that was, you know, if people were cracking jump serves, you might slide somebody in. But 
you know, I had half the floor, maybe two thirds if I was feeling really good on one day and try to keep us in system. And that was my main role. And then when I was in the back row, I was trying to dig everything anybody got past our blocker. So that was kind of the way it was. And, you know, it was out of kind of out of necessity, just created some value by really investing in the ball control side of things because, you know, we had monsters. I mean, I was six, three and jumped well, had a good arm, but we had guys that were touching over 12 foot and that's insane. You know, flying around and crushing balls. And we were playing against them too. I mean, it was, it was the heyday kind of a men's volleyball. It was kind of coming into its own and you had to look hard and hard and long for somebody that wasn't way over the net. So I had to create value within ball control. I've heard conversations about people saying that the 6'2", 6'3", 6'4", athlete in men's volleyball is on the verge of becoming extinct, or we will soon be eradicated. As a 6'2 and a half who probably claimed 6'4 <laughs> in college, <laughs> you know, I had these conversations with people and it came down to like, there's something about the tenacity of an athlete, no matter what size there are. We look at Steph Curry, who's uh, 6'3 as well, and you would think, okay, well, there's no way he can stand up to a 6'8 of LeBron or the 6'7 of Kobe, but he's doing it. So do you think that guys like us are in danger of becoming extinct in the men's game? And we could talk about indoor and beach too. Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. I think it's that's a reality. And I think what's more and more amazing, and you bring over the you know, kind of NBA crossover, I think that athletes within our sport and within the NBA sport are very complementary. You're dealing with a lot of the same valuable aspects. And obviously there's more money in the NBA or in volleyball or basketball on the national international stage. So, you know, the elite of the elitist of that kind of frame and that kind of athleticism are going to shuffle towards that sport inherently. But like we get kind of that next tier. And so as the NBA has gotten bigger and bigger, I think Steph could be towards the end of because now you got people like Luca, who's got a similar skill set, but he's significantly bigger, stronger. Right. And that's only going to con- more and more athletes like that are only going to continue to show up. So mm-hmm. I would love to say that, you know, ability to still contribute is there, but I mean, you can already see it happening internationally indoor for sure in volleyball and absolutely within, you know, within beach. I mean, it's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and there are some advantages to being bigger. Uh, yeah. Particularly if you're playing against people who are that size. Right. Uh, yeah, I think you got to have somebody out there with some size. There are teams that are proving us wrong. And, you know, kind of an elephant in the room for you. Like, I want to talk about maybe Kristen Nuss. Sure. Who, tiny little girl. Absolutely. And is destroying the U.S. and is soon to just tear apart the world, we think. Yep. And her partner, Taryn Cloth, who, for me, is the first person that I've seen that knows exactly how to utilize height. Hmm. You know, her cut shot is a cut hit. Her high line (laughs) is just hitting over people. And I see so many tall players, you know, they end up using these loops because they've seen all of maybe the guys like you and me, like six, two, six, three, who hit over a block with some arc or hit a cut shot that had some spin and loop. And every time I see Taryn, I don't know, detonate a cut shot. (laughs) You know, I'm like, that is the epitome of the sport. But then, you know, you have Kristen who, what is she, five, six? We'll give her five, six. We'll give her five, six on a college roster. (laughs) She's trying to get recruited. So how do you explain her success and how dominant she's been at a small height when I get tons of players who are looking at me saying like, well, I'm just not tall enough. Sure. You know, I'm pointing to these athletes going, what are you talking about? Yeah. No, I think that she definitely is poster child for keeping hope alive for the smaller <laughs> players, for sure. And, you know, I think if it was easy, you know, if things didn't have to fall exactly in line, there'd be more players like her out there. I mean, she is very unique in her ability, her eye-hand coordination, her change of speed. Like, even when we were we have the ability over the course of her career to like kind of have testing. So we're, we're looking at her metrics, which is reaction time, change of direction, acceleration. And she correlates with division one defensive backs. 
And like, that's not normal for anybody. So there's the genetic component. Clearly she probably would admit that she got maybe cheated a little bit on the hype side of things, <laughs> but she got cheated in no other way, shape or form in her ability to be an elite athlete. And she's worked her butt off and she's had great training and she still continues to improve. And I think that, you know, her, even when you watch her play and you see her ability to get a legitimate late look, like that's incredibly unique. So it's not just like one or two things that allow her to overcome her height. It is a laundry list of things that make her super special. And that may be the most critical one that she can really on takeoff, get that last look and know where the defender is, know where the blocker is. And then to be able to have the eye hand, the training, the execution to execute the correct shot over and over and over and over. Like that's yeah. what makes her super special. Do you think that she is still looking at the defense in her swing or is that decision coming upon takeoff? For me, I think my decision, I've actually changed the way I do offense. You know, I make a decision before the point starts and then I have some on and off switches and that leads me to be a little bit more consistent instead of waiting and looking. I like to be a little bit more proactive. Hmm. Do you think that she's looking on takeoff or is she still peripherally seeing things while in the air? Yep. And, and I did. It was interesting. I listened to your Billy Allen podcast and I remember you talking about like kind of limiting your decisions. I thought that was a great kind of line of conversation. I think that and you'd have to ask her specifically and I haven't talked to her really directly lately. But I think she keeps her options pretty wide open. And I think that a lot of the information she gets is at takeoff. And then I think that she has incredible peripheral so that she can make adjustments. Particularly, it's, it's a little bit harder if you're looking at the second level. But the late block moves, she's going to see that. So if it's mm -hmm. a late pull or if it's a late dive, I think that that is she can perceive that and she can make adjustments on that. So by second level, you mean the defense? Correct. The so, depth, yeah. First layer being the blocker, second layer, the deeper level being that defender. Okay. So she's probably getting a, most of her information maybe from initially, and this is without talking to her and without, you know, providing a scouting report for anybody, sure. <laughs> the potential to look at the defense early and then feel a blocker move late. And I think you can usually rely on the fact that defender will do opposite of the blocker. Right. Usually, yeah. I think some smarter teams know that a double up a couple times a set is valuable. Yeah, um, particularly you if you always... if you've unraveled where people are looking. Like if you know their initial information or their most valuable information is from a blocker or a defender, then you can use that to your advantage on a double up, and the double up can absolutely be good for you know two three points a set once you kind of determine what the the biggest um, kind of contributor is to unraveling the defense do you think it's more important to look at the blocker or the defender or is it just like would you just teach me to say look at the whole field i think it honestly depends on how you want to play the game okay if you want to shoot which if i had to choose i think you're going to get the most bang for your buck if you're able to determine where the defender is if you're athletic enough to keep the blocker at the net determine where the defender is and then use shots to your advantage to make them at least move and try and get something great. And then shot quality is what begins to be kind of your ultimate ally. Uh, you can't just shoot to the open space. You got to shoot to the right space in the open space. So in that scenario, Could you, you need to know that, that for a second, uh, the right space in the open space. Yeah. So if I've got a defender in, if I know for sure, I got a defender in the angle, I got a blocker in the line. So they're one running one on me. Oh, shot over line. And part of it is shape. That's the first equation, but location has to be the second part of the equation. So if you're Taryn, your shape can be flatter. If you loop a high line over a block that doesn't need to be looped, now you're giving away your advantage. So now you've hit the correct shot, but you haven't hit the correct shape for who you are. And some people may have to retain that loop, but um, you're just allowing the defender more time. So then the second part of the equation after shape is location. Well, if I hit the correct shape on my high line to the correct side of the court, but it's off the sideline, say it's six feet into the court, six feet from the corner, 
I've hit the correct shot, maybe even with the correct shape, but I've allowed a really great defender a, a little bit more of an opportunity than if I were to hit that three feet by three feet from the corner with the same shape. Mm-hmm. So that's that to me, all of that boiled down is a term we like to call shot quality. So it's not just the decision, like decision-making has to be on point, but the shot quality is kind of your safety blanket. Because even if you run a late, say you run a late four, and I've hit a high line. If I hit an average high line, they're going to be in great position to counter. If I hit great shot quality in my high line, now you're having to dig a ball that's in the back corner with great shape, and you're moving away from the net, maybe you even have to lay out a little bit. Like I've created an advantage, even if I don't make like the right decision because you ran a great play on me. So the shot quality piece, decision-making and shot quality go hand in hand. But ultimately, if I have great shot quality over and over, then I can get myself out of a jam at times whenever the the other team is just really great or Mm -hmm. they've, you know, I just made a wrong decision, but I hit a really, really good shot. Right. And and probably less likely to put yourself in a jam. I think early, um, you know, in my, all of my twenties, maybe, you know, I grew up, East Coast, so New York. You know, I had a couple summers in California, but in New York, so the quality wasn't necessarily great in terms of players. You know, I would get to the finals, and I remember the first finals that I was in, and I got my butt kicked. But I came out of that not mad. It was one of the few losses that I came not angry because it was the first time that I had played that quality, and I was like, that's where I'm going to be. That's what I need to do. But the first all of my 20s, I would be able to look and then just hit that area, like you said. And that was enough to get the points. And sure, they would come back for a few points or or dig me on a couple, but then somehow I would just, I guess, out-athlete them. And I finally, I I started realizing in qualifiers that hitting the correct decision is not enough. You need correct decision, then plus, like you said, shot quality, speed, speed change of location occasionally in the correct decision so it's not just over line or cut right it's right. like can i do it on the way up should i do it on the way down does it have to be sharper more inside more outside and how are they arcing yeah do you think that players find that naturally or is that something that they just need to be told over and over i think that it's not a natural progression And part of the equation is, and we have this conversation with younger players like juniors all the time when you're doing clinics or camps, it's kind of the process you went through where you had your epiphany is like what you're doing right now, just because it's successful, isn't like the end goal. Like you, you can't rely on your ability to beat the, the people you're playing now to determine if you're doing what needs to be done. Like you constantly have to push, you constantly have to elevate, you constantly have to adapt and you have to look ahead to where you want to be, not just try and be satisfied with where you are. I think that you, people don't just come to that realization on your own. I think very often, particularly early on, because early on, if you're successful and everybody's giving you a trophy, everybody's patting you on the back, like you're whatever, all the accolades you can get, you're getting all the bids you can possibly get. And you're not really thinking about like, okay, how can I be better? Like, what can I improve? And I think that's a lost art that has to be encouraged, trained, talked about, pushed. And then, you know, then you have a chance maybe to make the improvements that you need to make before you need to make them. And that's the key for me is when we talk to kids, we're like, Hey, you want to be, you want to put yourself in position to be good at the things you don't need to be good at yet because you're going to need to be able to be great at them or you won't be able to progress to where you want to go. If we're talking to a B or a guy in he's beating all of his buddies and he's, you know, finishing in the finals and, and taking home his beach chair and his umbrella, you know, as a prize <laughs> after each tournament, how does that person who doesn't, maybe doesn't have a coach and doesn't have the competition in front of him and in his face. How does he know when a shot is good enough? Are there any like litmus tests that you have, or do you just always say, can you do it faster? Can you do it better? 
and then just see how far that peak is. You know, it, it, I'm trying to find something that somebody out there can use when they don't have the opportunity to play against high level players. So they don't have to learn those lessons. Yeah, that's a great question, because if you don't have an actual test, it's really hard to really quantify. You know, if, if your block's only getting wrists over the net and you only have to hit a ball six inches over the tape to, to be successful. The only way in practice is you can get somebody with a boogie board who's going to, you know, give you a little bit better test, you know, and, and create some shape or, you know, maybe like limit the shots you can hit. So let them know I'm not going to go high line. I'm only going to score in the angle. Oh. And now you have a, a bigger challenge or maybe you put two defenders, maybe you put somebody defending line and angle with a block like in training. So now I, I can't just be decent and score. I've got to be great. And I think that once again, if you go back to the conversations that need to be had, it's not how can I be good or how can I be, how can I win? It's how can I be excellent? That's the bar that at some point you got to decide, am I willing to work to be excellent? Because good enough is probably good enough. In many cases, that guy in Illinois, he can get a whole slew of chairs and umbrellas. But is that, and if that's his goal, then he doesn't need to be excellent. But if he wants to be excellent, then I think you've got to be creative to push yourself into space that isn't easily found in that scenario. It's obviously way easier to find that in the beaches of California. If you're in a great training group, some in Austin or down in Florida and lots of places around the country. But if you don't have that, like it has to be within you that you want excellence. Otherwise you're just going to be the big fish in the small pond. It's so interesting that you said the put three defenders out there, you know, blocker and two defenders, because I actually did that for a number of trainings in my career. I was playing with Hudson Bates, who's now the associate head coach at Ohio State University for their men's program and USA Beach Juniors, something or other. Uh, <laughs> my best friend, I should know. Uh, <laughs> but that was something that we had to do because you know, if you have two higher level athletes or some people who you know are trying to push themselves, but then everybody else is, let's say, indoor players. So they really have no idea what the hell they're doing on defense. Right. How do we create a smaller court or a necessity for a better shot? Yeah. And while it might seem unfair to put three defenders in, all right, well, now you're probably looking at how would I approach the game if I just needed to hit every ball? And do I have that ability? And I think that could be so valuable yep. but don't you think that that ruins the decision process that a hitter would have to go through yeah i don't think that that can be your only training obviously mm -hmm. that's going to be you know a test that's going to push you into a space where you understand the value of the quality of the shot that has to be made and you maybe you do understand okay like what am i capable of? if if i have to pace balls if, if there's no other option like, how do I figure out how to get that outside hand? Or how do I figure out how to tool high, like all the tools maybe that indoor players are better at when they've got triple blocks in front of them? Like, can I carry that over to the beach side? Like, it's not maybe something you have to rely on, but at some point you're going to get in a situation, the nature of our sport, where there's going to be something you haven't seen before. They're going to be something that's that you've got to do differently than you're really comfortable doing. And the people that have the most tools in their tool belts, whether or not they use them every single day, uh, every single match, they're going to have the best chance to be successful when those moments happen where you face that 610 blocker for the very first time in your life. Like, <laughs> That's, this is different you know, as opposed to well, like what's normal. And I know what I can do in a normal situation, but have I done enough training that when something's abnormal, I can dig into my, you know, my tool chest and find something that could be productive in this situation. You talk about running into a 6'10 guy. What advice would you give to a player who they experience a higher level for the first time and they're in that match? You know, I first time you play Phil or first time you play Taryn, who's just over the net or, you know, a Brandy Wilkerson who's skying higher than any female out there probably right now. Yeah. And everything that you or at least some bailout shots that you used to have, now they're just closed down. How do you problem solve or keep your head when there's an athlete over there that is doing something that no one has done before to you and they're shutting it down? 
Yeah. I think that once again, when you end up with tools, because maybe you don't run, you don't move around very much. You don't use pace on your sets very much. You don't do things like that very much. And now you realize, well, I've got to do something different. If you don't have enough ability to change, then you're probably going to not be able to change the pathway that you're going down. But if you can adjust, even, you know, you know, got to watch the AVP New Orleans and, you know, Brandy was there and she was incredibly impactful. So you start to see people, you know, maybe passing a little off center and going over on two, at least giving her that look where now she's got to decide, like, where am I going to go? Am I going to, am I going to hang in the middle? And then we're running tempo to a different place. Well, if you've never even considered that possibility, there is zero chance you're going to be able to efficiently do it in the heat of the moment. So I think that's a part of the equation. The other part of the equation is you have to be mentally strong enough to accept that challenge and to be able to be clear minded enough to process, okay, what can we do? And part of it is personal confidence. Part part of it is a partnership confidence. Like, Hey, like I need to help you. And when we have that conversation, you can't be offended that I'm trying to help you. Like there's all kinds of things that come into play in those moments. And I would say there's probably not even a specific point that is like the main point. I think you have to be able to have lots of different things in that moment because they don't happen very often, not to great players. So to be able to prepare enough kind of avenues or outs that you can try a few things and not lose your confidence. And I think that that's the thing whenever I see players that I love watching getting in those moments is they're not afraid. Like they don't get rattled, like they may be frustrated, but they are always going to stay proactive in their ability to kind of solve this problem. Do you think it's more valuable to be a problem solver thinker there or a warrior who's just like, hmm. I don't care what you're doing. I'm going to do what I want to do. Or is it, you know, the person who's more ready to change their style of pass, set, hit, timing, et cetera? Yeah, I think that you, once again, I don't know if there's a perfect example. I think there's a lot of fun when you have that warrior, like, especially if they're facing a big block and they just come in and they're like not afraid. And, you know, I was kind of how I played when I was in college. I was like, when I got a set, it was going to end violently. <laughs> It was either going to be violently on your side of the net or violently on my side of the net. And I was totally fine with that. You might block me, but it's going to hurt your hand and you're going to get a hyperextended elbow. (laughs) Absolutely. And I'm okay with that. Like it's impressive when the ball hits the ground before me. I'm all right with that happening every once in a while. So I can respect that process. But I also think that, you know, there's a more cerebral approach where once again, you have to stay clear minded and maybe you're working that outside hand and it's not working, you've got to be able to have plan B and you may have to have a plan C and you might have to have a plan D. So, and each one of those plans would be a version of what you just mentioned. It may end up being the cerebral approach. It may be the warrior approach. It may end up being, you know, a technical approach, but I I will say in every single scenario, you know, ball control has to be once again, going all the way back to what, gave me an opportunity you have to be able to stay in system because if you can't then you're not going to be able to try anything else and it'll just get more and more frustrating you just give away any advantage that you may have with the tools that you're using i just had like a 30 minute call with somebody who's been coaching indoor for 20 minutes and she's (laughs) signing up for some of our programs because she her high school needed a volunteer to take (laughs) over the new beach volleyball programs and so she's just kind of hunting down and she bought our our practice plans and she might be signing up for our our whole coaching program but she said that her assistant coach got into the mindset where he's like this is a totally new program so they don't have volleyball players it's not like a volleyball hungry town and he's like well we got we got to work on hitting they're not hitting hard enough Mm -hmm. and she was like i you need to reframe your mind (laughs) (laughs) like pass and set and i even recommended and i don't know if you would recommend this but i'd like to hear your thoughts on it my libero in college he went to i think midlothian high school maybe in virginia and their school was known for the first two weeks maybe longer they didn't spike a single ball there was no jump and spike for two Mm -hmm. weeks and so i actually gave that advice to her i go very honestly 
if you can teach these girls to pass, set, dig, and move, them standing and being able to see the court and have control of where they place the ball will be up to a certain level significantly more valuable than their ability to jump and hit. Like they'll get more kills during that process than they would actually like trying to jump and putts that up. Of course, I think, yeah, there's a stop to that level. Sure. You know, like once you get to double A at some point, you're going to have to jump. But would you give that advice to any high school or club coaches? Or do you believe in, in the whole part of training where it's every drill should be pass, set, jump and hit versus just pass and set consistently? Because pros spend so much time in triangle that it's like, we're not really playing whole points so long question but do you have thoughts on yeah. that yeah. yeah absolutely and i would be definitely more in the vein of your philosophy and your suggestions particularly with not as talented like because odds are if you're at a level that's not as talented or not as polished you're probably playing against similar people more often than not particularly in our sport where you can kind of tailor you know, at the adult level or even at the junior level, you can tailor your competition to particular, like if you're playing open or you're playing levels. So it's not like you're going to be completely outclassed by the people you're across the net from. And I think no matter at what level it can be, I think I can make a pretty strong argument for, and I say this all the time as well, regardless of the surface, indoor, beach, sand, mud, snow, grass, if you just simply broke it down to whoever serves and passes better, you could really correlate that to who's going to win because the other skills are probably going to be relatively comparable. But the bigger component for me is if I stay in system, my setters are better, like period. Like if I've got a great setter and an average setter and the average setter is getting perfect passes and the great setter is getting shoveled all over the gym, I think my average setter can probably do just as good a job creating a hittable scenario than my great setter who will probably be exhausted by the end of the day and may not be able to produce as good a result as far as the consistency of attack. So like spending, it kind of goes back and I probably won't get it exactly right, but it is a fantastic little quote. And I'm not sure it's even properly attributed, but you know, the old Abra Abraham Lincoln thing, if I'm going to spend if I'm going to chop down a tree, I'm going to spend the first six of my eight hours sharpening my axe. Like to me, the ball control is the axe sharpening. That's what makes every skill that we do, particularly on the offensive side, more achievable and with a higher rate of success. So it makes my hitters better. It makes my setters better. You know, it makes my communication better. It makes my conditioning better. Like the better that I can control that first touch, then the better I'm going to be at whatever version of this game we're playing. Have you been able to quantify that as a programmer or as a coach to say, when we pass in X area, hitting percentage goes up or down? Yeah, that would be an interesting study. I think part of the problem with our sport at the college level particularly is there's so much data that has yeah. that's collected it's really hard to compile it. And even if you can't compile it, then it's all different players playing against different people. So if you got one pair and you're getting every touch they've got and there's some consistency to the interpretation, it's way more effective. I haven't ever seen that kind of correlation done, but we have, you know, I think this is the whole NCAA compliance thing. I think college programs in general. Yeah have targets that they're shooting for and the targets that they're shooting for from a side out percentage, first ball kill percentage, pass percentage, you know, are going to put them in a zone where they feel like, okay, if we can meet these parameters, then we're going to be in a great position to be successful in the win loss category because we have enough data to know, like, these are some pretty solid, you know, points that we're going to try and be successful with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that, if we could do that, I think that it would show what we're talking about. Like you could really find direct correlations between the passing statistics versus and then what kind of the correlation to the success rate on wins, losses, side outs, media kills, all of those things. For sure. I mean, we have those stats. We've had them for a long time for indoor, right? I'm, Absolutely. We know that front middle 
you can pretty much live and die by that that front middle pass and that's where your percentages go up and i think it was reed pretty who when he started making his shift to the beach he was like there's so many stats there's so much personnel in indoor and we have these numbers that we can achieve and they just don't exist this was you know, six years ago, maybe five, sure. six years ago. And he's like, but why don't they exist in beach? And so he started hiring a team literally to try to quantify, take all of these stats, quantify and say like, okay, where do we have to pass? Where's the best side out overall? Where's the best side out for us? And then I ended up getting to work with Jordan Chang, who is now Kelly Clay's husband and coach yeah. and USA super coach. He loves stats. Yeah loves paying attention to them and you know was able to show me that i was hitting literally 20 percent less in transition hmm. and that was like ouch and they were all just coming from blocks and hitting errors sure so i made a new rule for myself no blocks no hitting errors in transition so if the ball's in the back half of the court all right i'm going to choose very safe areas <laughs> That's and right. like immediately pad my <laughs> Absolutely. my stats yeah yeah, and, and I think an understanding, I think part of the issue is at the college level, because you can't necessarily get all the stats you need, it's understand having players understand how the stats work so that they know what an error does to themselves. You know, what they know what an ace does, if they get aced, what it does to their ability to be successful. So even if you can't, like, necessarily give them stacks of data that, are what you were able to see that were able to influence your decision making. If you understand that when I dig a ball, my job is to not error. Like I want to kill the ball, but I can't error. Like that can't be a part of the equation. Um, I've done all the hard work. My partner's doing hard work to get me in position and I can't let them off the hook. Worst case scenario, they've got to get a dig. They've got to transition. They've got to come right back at me because when I give away that point, then like I'm killing myself basically is the, is the bottom line. And even without a hitting percentage, even without knowing that 20%, if you understand the value and how it works, then you have a much better chance of, of, of not never erring because we, you want to stay aggressive, but right. Yeah. You don't want to speak to yourself in negatives, right? Yeah. yeah you don't like, I dug it. Just don't error. Just don't error. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't need like the, the things that are crazy is like, I sprawl and get a dig. My partner lies out and gets a dig and I'm running to bump it over. And I try and hit a bump cut. That's going to score against the team. That's like, like just don't. And you hit it in the net, mm. you know, like what's the point of that? Like there's like, you have to understand like when you can be and when you can't be aggressive and controlled or when you just have to reboot and make them beat you as opposed to just letting people off the hook. I think that's such a, a good point that most people I'd say just completely miss, you know, they go for kills when they're in very uncomfortable situations or they'll go for a crazy spot when the other team is super comfortable waiting for them. You know, I think one of my pet peeves as a coach, when I see other people playing is when people, especially on a men's net, I'll say like, uh, I might be a little bit more forgiving with it on a women's net, but on a men's net, when people will bump it over or try to hit a, a cut shot or a short shot when they're really off balance and in trouble and yeah, it might pay off, but if that other team has any form of ball control, or even if they don't, now they have a small pass and an easy set, you know, you can argue that they can't get back behind half court, maybe it'll ruin their approach. But if they're balanced, and even if they have medium ball control, you've given them a chance to have easier ball control as opposed to my magic button is that deep middle. Yeah. Like, chuck it deep middle. Anytime you're in trouble, let them fight over it first, let them freeze in the middle, and then they have to scramble and maybe rush to the set a little bit more. Well, and if nothing else, it gives you an opportunity to get back in the court and get balanced to give a, a great defensive look. And these days, and even more, like if you have decent ball control, you're not going to see a set. The ball is going to go up on one and it's coming over on two. So now you've jammed yourself up even more in trying to be in position to defend. And it just makes your life even more challenging. That's a another deeper thought that's that next level like great coaches like yourself can you see three steps down the road you know so i talked about maybe a good pass and a good set that's two steps down the road you're saying but where are we going to be on defense 
by the time their team has recovered from that, now we're still in scramble mode, just attempting to get back to position. Yeah. And yeah, your defense is then significantly worse. Right. Hey, what was the transition like coaching from going from indoor to coaching beach? How did you end up becoming a beach head coach when you were an indoor head coach for a long time? Yeah, it's a pretty fun story. So kind of goes back, it, kind of the backstory is all the way back to USC. So when I was at USC, my setter was Steve Loeswick. And when I was working at Rice and we were out recruiting all the time, I'd always try and get back to get, he actually, I got married before my senior year of college. And um, yeah, so Congrats. I, I redshirted. Yeah, it was great. It was a great deal. I redshirted, so I had a fifth year and we were having trouble my wife and I, or my girlfriend at the time, she went to to a nearby school and I was having trouble finding a roommate. Steve and I were, we had kind of some good options, but, but we needed another person. And so we got, I got engaged over Christmas and we were looking at the following summer, but in the course of us trying to unravel this roommate situation, we just decided to get married that summer. And so she could live with us. So she ended up, we got married a year early so my fifth year, we lived in an apartment with my setter, Steve. And so it was a really fun arrangement. Um, that's cool. <laughs> so that's the yeah, backstory. I mean, you get married, you save on rent. It's brilliant. Absolutely. <laughs> so when I was working at Rice with the indoor program, Steve was working at LSU as an indoor assistant coach. And so when we got recruiting, we'd always hang out, had a great relationship. It was always fun to see him. Got to know Fran Flory, the head coach, and Joe Wilson, who was the assistant coach at the time, really well. So we became friends. And then whenever LSU decided we're going to start a beach program, Fran reached out and said, hey, I know you play beach. I trust you. I know you understand kind of the compliance and the whole athletic department kind of ability to, to function in that environment. And, and so that's, we want to do it right. We want to start it out well, like not being a jam as far as being able to, you know, stay out of trouble from all the important things. And so they asked me to come and run it. And that was kind of how I went from the indoor side to the beach side of NCAA coaching. And at the time, probably for maybe the 10 years before I made that switch, I played significantly more beach than I played indoor because, you know, it's fun. So, because it's better. <laughs> yes. Well, I, you know, but we won't, say, we won't say that out loud. Yeah, okay, we can. You can edit that out later. <laughs> so that was my progression, you know, really cut my teeth in college coaching on the indoor side of things, learned a ton, and then used that knowledge um, and then kind of the beach experience to hopefully transition well into into beach coaching at the college level. So from indoor coaching to beach coaching, what was one thing that you absolutely had to throw out from indoor coaching that you originally thought was probably the same in beach? Was there anything that you can think of that you're like, you were teaching for the first maybe year or two as as coaching beach volleyball players, but you were like, man, I brought that from indoor and that is not applying here. This may not be exact answer but one of the things that stands out is i assumed that the sport like the team environment would be comparable but it wasn't nearly comparable it was something that you really had to train particularly for kids who were beach players at the junior level because they got to pick their own partners if it didn't go well they just switch and go to a different partner there really at the time weren't very many even club affiliations so it was really a like it was a personal, it was almost an individual sport. So the great beach players who were coming into college, they might not have even played with their indoor teams for high school. They were devoted to the sport. And so now you bring them into an environment where not only do they not get to pick their partners and they have to work with other people, they have to rely on the coaches, but they also have to care about what all these other kids are doing, because that's what's going to rely on whether or not they're successful. They could win every match and the team could still lose every match and you wouldn't be like in a great place mentally. So I think for me, that was a big kind of learning moment that I realized we've really got to invest in our understanding of how this plays out because it, it can't just be like, I'm successful because I won my match. It has to be a push into understanding that we all, I could lose every match and we could win the national championship hmm. as opposed to what everything up until that point was. If I don't win every match, 
I have zero chance for success. So it's just a, it was a really different environment. One that you don't deal with in indoor volleyball, because in indoor volleyball, everybody knows I can hit a thousand and we're going to lose and I'm right. not going to have fun. So that was probably the biggest thing that really was like an understanding of, okay, we got to really make an investment in this space. For this same conversation that I had today, I think you're kind of brushing alongside of all of the questions that she gave to me. And, you know, all I can do is regurgitate pretty much what I hear from successful club directors and college coaches, because I don't have the club system. I haven't coached club. I stay away from parents and bosses as much as I can. <laughs> Understandable. I respect that. <laughs> So for the high school coach out there who is now, she's got a wake up call, right? And she's like, yeah, he's right. How do I then promote a culture where people support each other, but still compete? And her specific problem was she's worrying a year in advance how she's going to select partners. Hmm. So do you have any specific tips for creating that culture or just maybe a warning or a common mistake that you see? club coaches are making that you just wish, man, you should have handled this with them before they got to me. Yeah. I think that that's an unavoidable challenge of the sport, particularly if you're coaching at the high school or college level, that may be controversial, but I think that for me, that's the, one of the hardest days of the year in our whole season is when you set the initial lineup because you work so hard to create a great culture and have this team that bonds well and, and like you say, competes against each other, but roots for each other. Yeah. But in the back of their mind, they're all, they all want to be in the lineup. They all want to play a pivotal role. And so you're trying to build within them an understanding of their value as people, as part of the team, what they can bring to the table, how they are important. And as Dave comes closer and closer, it becomes clearly evident that it's going to be a struggle for a lot of them to retain that understanding that their value isn't in the lineup, the value, because that's not what the world tells them. When that lineup gets released, you know, their parents are going to ask them, and this is for any coach at any level, the parents are going to ask them, Hey, where are you? Like, how'd you do? Like who are you playing with and where are you playing? And that's indoor. It'd be like, Hey, you know, wh where are you starting in the lineup? Or, you know, like, what's your, what's your role? So it's, when you're trying to encourage people to understand that that's a part of the equation, but it's not the most important part of the equation, it's challenging. So for that coach that's out there and is kind of sees that looming, that's a great understanding of how it could impact what, in my opinion, is the most important thing. And that's the culture of your program because it will be influential. And so the time has to be spent building these players up and creating value in them where they understand who they are is not where they are in the lineup. Because if you don't intentionally invest in that conversation, then it'll immediately go there as soon as you release it. And mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to get out from under it. It makes it really difficult, but it is not, you can't avoid it. Like it's going to be there. So how can we be most intentional about creating the value outside of it? So that when that does come, we survive it. And typically in my experience. It's the relationships within the team. The more that they've bonded, the more that they care about each other, the more that they support each other, the more they've gone to battle with each other as opposed to against each other, then they have the ability to respect where they are and to still hope for greatness from individuals and from the team while still productively fighting to kind of break in and get those opportunities in a playing perspective. If you had to form a team and team A is a nine out of 10 skill and a seven out of 10 chemistry and then vice versa. So nine out of 10 chemistry, but a seven out of 10 skill, which one is your one team and which one is your two team? Oh man. If it was the six, it'd be harder, but then since you bump it to the seven, that might be a good <laughs> point. I also think it personalities come into play as well. Like there's, uh, as you know, because in like, once again, this could be controversial, but like, I, I know that I played with guys on my team um, who before practice tried to choke me, like literally tried to choke me, but I could go to battle with him and it would not be an issue mm -hmm. like on the court. Absolutely zero. Like I hope he's the best and he hopes I'm the best and we're going to celebrate, give each other a high five. And maybe even afterwards we could still have a little bit of beef, but when we're playing, it is zero issue. 
I don't think there. that's the case necessarily <laughs> for a lot of girls who play the sport. So I think, once again, it could be controversial to make that statement, but I, I do And a lot we're talking in giant generals, right? Like Correct. Absolutely yeah. huge generals. You can find people that doesn't matter at all, regardless of their gender. But for the, I think that for the most part, when you get, if those girls who are playing together, like care for each other, love each other, like respect each other, like they're going to get more out of each other. And it would matter if there was some friction within them. So if I had to, without knowing personalities, I think you've got to go, if it's that exact scenario, you almost have to go with the more athletic, you know, more capable pair if it's that close. But I tell you what, the team with the chemistry is going to make it much more of a battle than it should be. And they'll take them sometimes because that's a huge piece of the puzzle. It's an enormous one. And, and I know from a team perspective, you see it when you watch like programs play programs that have that deep chemistry, they find ways to make life miserable on their opponents and to celebrate. And I think that once again, this is kind of a little side tangent, but success is kind of what you choose it to be. And when it's something bigger than a win on the scoreboard, you have a chance to kind of live in a more healthy space and be and play with more freedom, if that kind of makes mm. sense. You know, and I think the chemistry team is going to have more longevity and more sustained, let's just say fight, yeah. you know, sustained presence to be there to show up in the weight room. So maybe... If they're seven out of 10 now in skill, because they've got the chemistry, the ability to show up, cooperate, get along with each other, support each other, they're going to show up better more frequently. So maybe their rate of improvement becomes higher than the current nine of 10. You know, maybe, right. maybe they're actually making those progressions a lot faster because of the yeah. ability to show up. And they want to work together. They actually look forward to not just investing in their own game but to actually growing their chemistry as a pair. I think that's an advantage. That's a real advantage for sure. I'm going to put you on the, on the hot seat here. Let's say I'm going to bring you into my club and coach, I just need one actionable thing today. I want you to take over my practice for 45 minutes and fix my chemistry. Mm. You know, you don't have to fix it completely. What's one action or drill or, I don't know, field trip that creates or builds chemistry? I think part of the component that would need to be part of the equation would be fun. I think that we play a sport and the sport is a game at a more organized level. And if you aren't having fun while you're doing it, it's really hard to be who you need to be, like to have the mind, the mentality. If it's work, and you're grinding all the time. I think some people can embrace that, but way more across the board, there's going to be the ability to make progress if you are having fun. And okay, so in this 45 minutes, how do you make me have fun? I think we spend a little bit of time, um, once again, depending upon the level, we spend a little bit of time, particularly initially, just doing some like fun games, like with the sport, obviously, like we might do, you know, don't drop the baby where if you play it kind of in a queen's format where one person is holding a ball and the other person is not. And so you're playing volleyball, like normal volleyball, but the person who's contacting the ball has to get rid of the ball they're holding. So if you and I were in a partnership and I had the ball and I got served while the serve was coming to me, I'd have to flip it to you. You would catch it. I'd pass to you. You would flip it to me while you go into set. And then I flip it back to you when I attack. And the other side is doing the same thing. Do you um, have to use three touches? If you want to maximize the challenge and okay. the enjoyment or the kind of the comic relief from the coaching <laughs> side of things, then you absolutely make them use all three touches. But if they get into kind of like a competitive environment, then they can, because part of it's brain work, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're trying to figure out how can I do this and how can I be most successful? So we will at time or we won't. I have seen at times where you might map, like you might say you have to have at least two contacts so okay. that there has to at least be a part of the equation where you have to get rid of the ball and make a touch and then get the ball back and get the ball back over the net, at least two. So you might start the game. We do, or 
another thing that you could do would be like some type of alternate contact where you have to have an offhand third contact. So if you're right-handed, you can only attack the ball over the net with your left hand and vice versa. So something that kind of creates a little levity, a little enjoyment, like people screwing up and not being absolutely offended, you know, that they messed up or that their partner messed up. It's like, there's a lot of laughter, something to loosen it up. And then you can also circle back around and say, look, your brain had to think in different ways and you need to, so it's productive, but it's fun. And then I think, you know, you let that springboard you maybe into a new space, but at the end of practice, I think something that's really productive and it takes some time to really, for people to get good at it, but you can ask them pointed questions like, Hey, what was the best play you saw today about somebody else? Or you might ask them the person who's sitting next to you, what was the thing that most impressed you about their game today? I love Uh, that. So you create an atmosphere now where they're looking around at what's going on around them, as opposed to just completely engulfed in who they are and what their responsibilities are. In a drill, you might say at the end of the drill, who was the best passer on this court or who was the best server? And so it not only puts them in a position where they have to look at other people and and how successful they are and what they're doing great, but it also kind of ignites a fire that, hey, I, I want to be the person that's, that's the best passer on our court. So it's, it's twofold. And I think that that's you have to take the temperature of your group to know kind of what is more needed. But I think that those are two things that are really practical fun. And then being able to recognize greatness around you as opposed to just completely focusing on your own success. I love the compliments, the end of a game or a match. I tried that. I got to kind of assist slash have a speaking role with a college team. And we did something like that. I said, you know, right now guys, like, who is the best hard driven ball digger? And then there are a couple of different points, but some of the girls are like, like me, like they, <laughs> like they clearly didn't think that their team had the same, like respect for a certain part of their game. Yeah. And it felt good for them to feel announced. And then it, it did create, like you said, some, some laughter, some giggles. And then I also had them all s- scout each other. Mm. I said, who on your team has the best cut shot? Yeah. And, you know, some, they picked somebody who wasn't even in the top five teams Hmm. and she was like, oh, what? They're like, yeah, it's nasty, (laughs) you know? So it was fun. And it's fun because I think I took this from, not that I've ever been in an acting class, but I've watched a TV series where the guy was in an acting class (laughs) and they basically ask people to, they ask the class to categorize you in terms Hmm. of a character. They say, without knowing them with like the little speech that you've known what types of character should she or he play? And what I loved about that was your outward projection, what, how other people see you. 99.9% of people never ask that. I know people who are like, I'm a great setter. Uh, My setting's perfect. Mm -hmm. And my immediate response to that is always like mentally, how many people have told you that? Right. Like, where is this either confidence coming from? I'm glad that you're confident, but is it to the point where you're not willing to work on this because you think it's so perfect Mm -hmm. and who told you, you know, you need to be told that. So I think I like that kind of acting progression where you get to see what people think is a threat in you or what people think, you know, that they could pick on. And because people stay inside themselves so much, they'll usually never develop that unless they have that really uncomfortable conversation and they ask Mm -hmm. I went through a process one time where I emailed, I think seven or eight of my old partners. And I just wanted to know, I said, what was the worst part about playing with me? Just like, give me like one detailed thing. I don't want you to pull any punches and trust me. Like I know it wasn't easy. So just tell me. And the funny part is I got a lot of information from that to fix myself. Hmm. Not one of them asked me the same question back. Hmm. So even if you open that sort of discomfort, vulnerability, that doesn't mean that it's automatically going to come back, you know, and maybe they will down the road. Maybe it's not important to them. Yeah. But I think it's definitely important to get, like you said, a, an outward view and to create a situation where people can have the opportunity to compliment you on something or speak to your game 
so that we stop listening so hard to the inner voice that might be saying wrong stuff because yeah. that's not how other people actually see it. Yeah, that's a huge fight at the next level is kind of silencing the voice that is hypercritical, particularly when you're talking about groups of, you know, high performing, elite, super successful. Like it can get really counterproductive really quick if you just leave people alone to their own thoughts. They need the outside voices, you know, and, you know, sports psych is a huge battlefront. I mean, it's probably one of the most uh, important spaces that we're operating in right now at the at the college level. And obviously at the professional level, you're going to deal with the same thing. So anytime you can create vulnerability, you know, and truth and and open conversation like you're going to have a chance to kind of head some of those challenges off maybe before you would otherwise, if you just kind of lead people to their own thought process. I want to circle back to indoor to beach. And you said that the number one thing you had to work on was chemistry. Was there anything technical? So for, cause most, I'd say most of our listeners currently are not part of college programs and, and don't have the hope of being in one, but what from indoor, what skill, from indoor or concept from indoor do you think that people make the mistake of bringing to beach too much i would say probably the whole offensive mindset i think because there really is only one option if you're playing indoor and that's to bring the pain <laughs> and if you're really really good at that then you can be really successful at the indoor game. You don't need to be able to have a lot of variance. Like you have to be able to have range. Mm. That's important. But as far as shape, shape is a non-existent concept offensively indoor. Tempo off your hand is, there's a slight variance, but once again, you don't need, like if, if you can only hit the ball 100 miles an hour, you won't need to do anything else. Like you could literally go through life and until your shoulder falls off, like you could, that's what you could do. Yeah. So I think that would be like the creativity offensively, like for indoor players transitioning, like when, the, until they start to understand how to create shape off their hand, how to create, like change their arm speed, like all the things that you, you need to do to be able to create a huge variety of offensive attacks. And then that doesn't even get into pokey versus open hand tip and all of those things where you, you start to kind of get, but I think that's probably the biggest challenge is like to kind of deprogram the offensive side of things where I know, like, I'm just going to come in, I'm going to blow something up. Hmm. And that's not always the right decision. And if you can't, it becomes even more problematic when you can't, like create the shots that are necessary for our game. Even if you're a great swinger, you're going to face big blocks. You're going to face really talented defenders. And if you have a very limited arsenal, you're not going to win. I mean, it's just not possible unless you're way bigger than the people on the other side of the net, which doesn't happen most of the time. So I think that that's probably the thing that takes a little convincing and it takes time. Like it really takes time for people that aren't, don't have any background in the beach game. Sure. It's interesting because I, you know, sometimes my advice runs counter to that. And it's funny when you post as many things as we post um, and people don't look at the body of work. It's like, listen, mm -hmm. I can make a post and send it out to 50,000 people. And it might be talking to one athlete who had one little problem and this is how we fixed it. Meanwhile, on the same court, three minutes later, I talked to another athlete and told her to do the exact opposite to bring them like both from their ends of the spectrum into the middle. But when we talk about indoor to beach, a lot of times I'm telling people like, Hey, don't try to be too beachy. Yeah. You know, if you had a great swing and a great approach, all right, fix your approach and fix your timing and whatever you have to do to get your sand legs. But I see so many bangers, and, you know, we we're talking about like Taryn Cloth, who has a, a hit cut shot and you come out here and you're six, seven. And now all of a sudden you're like hitting these loopy cut shots and high arcing high lines. I think a lot about Robbie Page, who's seven, one hmm. and his cut shot 
had upward trajectory. Meanwhile, right. he's contacting, you know, his hand is above the top of the antenna. And so he yeah. sent it higher than the top of the yeah. antenna. And I was like, you're imagining the beach game from the standpoint of looking at all of the six, two, six, three guys. And that's yeah. who you modeled yourself after. Yeah. So I think some people try to come to the beach and they get too beachy yeah. and they forget like, Hey, you're a strong, powerful, jumpy, hard hitting athlete. Yeah. Maybe utilize some of that. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with that. And once again, it depends on the athlete you're dealing with. If it's somebody like that, then obviously you want them to explore the angles now that they can create. You know, you want them to explore the way that they can use it because you only got one blocker and you only got one defender. So now let's figure out where that pace is most appropriately applied as opposed to, you know, just going high seam every time. Because once again, you have to have creativity or we're going to figure out what you do and we're going to defend it. Even if you're enormous, we're going to be able to adjust our game to it. And I will, this is just kind of, cause I know she'll appreciate it. Taryn's last name is Cloth. So she will Close. be delighted if, if, <laughs> if I get her that. name right once. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Got it. All right. Taryn Cloth. You guys heard it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's all right. People have been saying my name wrong for 36 years now. So. <laughs> yes. There are some tougher ones out there. Yeah. Okay. So from indoor to beach, what is one thing that people need to carry with them that they should be bringing? Like me saying like, Hey, you know, be an athlete or, or bring what you have. Yeah. What is one thing that you didn't think would apply to the beach that, you know, after a few years, like, Oh, we should just do that. Like we do it in indoor. Yeah. I think from a training perspective, and this goes back to one of the first things we talked about. If you're a primary passer indoor, you're getting thousands of reps, thousands. Everybody on the beach is a primary passer. And yet we rarely even begin to approach just purely serve, receive technical touches to that volume. And it's really? more important. I think generally. That's, okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to say like, that's my every day. <laughs> yeah, no, I, and I do think the people who are successful know that they have to invest in that way. But if you're talking about, if we're talking to juniors, players, clubs, you know, high schools that are doing that, I think way more often like kids show up and they want to play because the sport is so fun to play, but mm -hmm. everything about their existence is compromised because they can't handle that first touch particularly when they're too young to do some of the other things that take more strength and, and maybe more training, but you won't advance as fast as you can until you can handle the first ball over the net. So it always frustrates me once again, not for the elite of the elite, but for the ones who are growing into the sport that they're not willing to invest the types of reps that you see generally indoor at those same levels when you come to the beach side of the game, because they, I just don't know why it just doesn't carry the value. And it's more important. If you had five minutes for a warm up, would you choose a physical body warm up? Would you choose pepper or would you choose serve pass? I could only do one of the three. Yep. Yeah. Five minutes. <laughs> I would probably do the serve pass because it gives you the most facets of real game like experience. So you can still get your first touch. You obviously still get setting. You still get attacking. You have a net in play. You get a feel even for the conditions that you're going to be competing in, which you may not really get a full understanding of, you know, how the sand's going to react or how the wind on this particular day is going to react if you're in a more confined space or you're not doing full full movements or you're not doing volleyball movements. So because of those, I think all are valuable. I would hope that we'd have time to do all three. But if we didn't, I would probably do like the all encompassing because I think that there's lots of factors that, that you need to know from experience before you actually get into that competition. What do you think about uh, John Mayer? I'm not gonna ask what you think about John Mayer. He's a great guy. I'll say that he's kind of known for hating pepper. <laughs> you know, he, he like yeah. he wishes that everyone would completely do away with it. And sure. I remember when he was playing and we were practicing against each other that he would drop balls at the service line and just start serving. You know, there was no like pepper, no back and forth or anything. You would just start serving and he would ask people to serve over the net at him. That was a Syrian. and that's what he's, maybe he's using it at LMU. But is there a place for pepper in your program? How important is it? How much do you do it? Yeah. Once again, I'll speak generally. Mm. I 
for sure we'll talk to John about the next time I see him because it sounds like it'd be a really fun conversation. <laughs> I tend to think that there is some productivity in Pepper, but it's about how you do it. Mm. Once again, pet peeve, people that go through Pepper because everybody uses it except for John. And when those reps are wasted reps, then yeah, it's a waste of time. Like if all it does is kind of get your heart rate up and maybe make your arm be a little bit loose, then it's a waste of time. But if you and I are peppering and I have the ability to say, hey, like I really need to work on my high right outside. Can you attack some balls at me in that direction? Or I really need to work on my open overhead, like within pepper or maybe you know, so there's all kinds of pepper variations, right? That if I'm being productive, like if every single day, if I have trouble going to my left and extending and playing one arm dig to my left, mm -hmm. but every single day in a pepper, I work on that. There's zero chance at the end of two months that I'm not going to be significantly better if I use that five to 10 minute pepper session to intentionally work on that touch. And you can pick and choose and you can, it can knock stuff off your list that, yeah, it's not real world, like in game touches, but there's zero chance I'm not going to be better at that specific skill. I think, and you could go down the list of things that you can start to influence. Like if I really want to work on getting my late look, a practical way to do it is look down before I attack and pepper and get back to the ball and see if I can get my hand on it, see if I can control it. Have my partner show me a number after they set me with their hand so that I have to look at it and call it and then make a contact. Like, I think if you use it productively, Pepper is a fantastic tool, not the best tool. I don't think you should only Pepper, but like you can legitimately get better. It's great for posture work. It's great for technique. I think it's if you do it right, it can be challenging physically. You know, there if are you times do it right. If it, you do it right, that, it's got to be the most important. Like that's the it, you have to be intentional and you have to do it right because otherwise it is it is a waste of time for sure. And probably ninety percent of the time, most of the time you see pepper, it's a waste of time. Hundred. I hope that that becomes a sound point. Uh, sound <laughs> bite. <laughs> no, because it is right when you see people standing there, and then I was the jerk in college. You know, I made things always harder or the hardest level that I could for everybody. When coach gave us an assignment, I'm like, my mind went, Hmm, how can I make this more difficult? You know, so I challenged people, I would hit at their head and you know, I'd hit out to the side of them and then people get pissed when you ruin their pepper flow, <laughs> right? They're pissed. And in my yeah. mind, I go, don't you think you should be awake enough right now to be able to get that or to dig a ball that is above your belly button for the first time? Yeah. Like, you're not going to ask the other team to hit on you, but they're like, no, I'm just warming up. I go, don't you think this is an important part of warming up? Like adding a little bit of range. I'm not going crazy here. I'm not punting a ball a hundred yards and telling you to sprint after it. I'm just saying, can you drop a knee while yeah. we're peppering? And can you handle right. a ball at your shoulder? There has to be an, an agreement with that, but I'm, I a hundred percent agree with you. 90 I'll, I'll, bump that up 99 percent of the time i see people peppering it's a waste yeah when you're just sleep you could do it unconsciously you don't sweat you're not out of breath you haven't if you finish a pepper session and they're you're still glistening clean and oily and there's not a speck of sand on you that was officially a waste of time absolutely now that's my take on it <laughs> I, I completely agree <laughs> like you should need a break after you pepper Yes. <laughs> if you do it well. Yes, absolutely. Do you have any absolute favorite drills that you love to use or you think uh, just very important for a junior's coach, a, a club director that should be a, a staple? Yeah, I, I think I like to change drills a lot. So, oh, you're one of you those. Don't, you don't get in a rut. There's obviously kind of variations that you would do. You know, I, I tend to lean towards kind of full spectrum drills so that you can work on lots of different things. There'll be a, a focus, but then you'll also be able to like, cause in a team setting, and this is at any level, you have to program to the overall team need. So what that means is you got 20 players, 18 of them need work on this. The two that don't need work on that as much, like that's not, they need work on something else more specifically. 
they have to be able to engage in that drill in a way that they can still be productive. They can still get better. They can still address some of the things. So the more skills you have within a drill, the more likely you are in a group setting to give people opportunities to continue to grow their game while you're working on a specific focus. Mm. So one of the drills that I really enjoy doing, and, and it's within the past, you know, six months or so that we've been, one of the things I think is really valuable and probably un, less understood than it needs to be is within the sport of beach volleyball, particularly as you grow and you get into the sport, being able to create the shot that you need to hit as opposed to hitting the shot that the play leads you into. So if I'm a great cut shot when the ball is inside and tight, then I hit my cut shot when the ball is inside and tight, as opposed to when the ball is off and out. Now I'm terrible at hitting a cut shot and I won't do it because the set didn't lead me into that play. Mm -hmm. Okay, That limits your ability to be successful because it gives the defense a huge advantage because they know whenever the set happens, you're probably going to go to your comfort shot and you'll do it really well, but it takes some offensive pieces off the table. So when we try and create, I like to try and create drills where you have to initiate with a certain shot and it's off serve receive, it's in real time and you can't hit another shot and it might not be practical, but you've got to figure out how to get it to that spot to start the drill. So it might be a drill overall, like we would do if I had some group that I happen to be coaching and, and we might do a drill that would be like a, a Queens based, but the initial contact might be a high line, but the blocker is going to block line mm -hmm. and the defensive team's going to run a four. Okay. So the defender will run a four, the blocker is going to block line and I have to pass set and hit a high line regardless of how the play unfolds. I love those drills. Yeah. So now the grand scheme of things is I'm, is the person who's in serve receive is working on creating a good high line over a big block. Right. That's the focus of the drill. But now I got defensive player that's transitioning, hopefully a, a great high line ball and having to transition out of it. I've got a blocker that's having to transition set. Those are huge two key components of being great on defense. I'm taking away the decision making process. Like I know those things are, are really important, Sure, but there's all kinds of ways. So I've got a blocker who maybe hits great high lines but now I'm getting them to max jump and shot block and, and, transition, and transition set mm. over and over. So even if they snap high lines over the block with ease, it within that drill, they're still having to focus and find ways to improve. Even the, from the serving aspect, we're initiating with a real serve. I can work on my short serve. I can work on my line serve. I can work on the deep loop serve. So we're always trying to push and create these drills anytime I'm in any setting with any group we've got to create drills that are multifaceted with a focus, but also giving as many people opportunities to work on as many things as possible. So one, like it's got to be more important to be engaged than when I'm getting the rep in the drill that it's supposed to be working on some particular thing. Every piece of the puzzle has to be valuable. And when you're in a group setting, like you inevitably you have people out of the drill, yeah. but you don't want them to be out of the drill mentally and physically until they absolutely are in the serve receive spot. Mm -hmm. Every piece of the puzzle has to have something where we can train and we can be better and we can fight for technique and we can really invest in a way that allows us to improve until we even get to the point where we're the focus of the drill. Mm. We do a similar drill. We do a lot of drills kind of like that where it's all right, this is the shot you need, right? The first explanation that I have to do after the drill is, and I know that the defender is going to be cheating. Like right. you guys are not going for a kill here. You're going for the best version of your high line. And I'm telling you now it's going to get dug. So don't tell anybody not to get cheat. Like you're not going to get right. a reward from a great That's high right. line. You're just repping it out. And even, you know, <laughs> when you have, the defensive side investing properly, like they're going to understand that the longer I hold, like it can't score, like they're, they can't let that ball score, but the longer I hold, the more I'm going to get out of it. Cause I'm yes. going to test myself at the end of my range. And maybe I'm going to have to dive and play it with my left hand when I'm going into that, you know, the left side line shot, like mm -hmm. there is an absolute like ability to like engage in the drill 
to the extent that you want to be challenged on your own. So yeah, it'll get dug. And from an awesome side, we got to deal with that, but I'm still trying to hit the best shot I can. And as a defensive player, I'm trying to hold as long as I can. So I get the most out of that rep as opposed to going and standing there and bumping it right when it hits me on the platform. So there's all kinds of ways to maximize our ability to improve given a particular challenge. Some athletes will do that on their own. So we do high line pepper and we did this for USA training, which is just a line. And after you hit, you become the blocker after you jump block and set, then you go to the back of the line and you just keep this high line going. But players started challenging themselves to wait so much hmm. that the goal of the drill was to keep going and get some transition sets. So right. they kept waiting so long. The high lines were so quality that like we weren't getting any digs. And then yeah. Alzina, he was like, you guys have to dig some of these. <laughs> right. like, leave a little bit earlier so that we actually get some transition reps. Yeah. So we ended up making a drill where if you get touched on a high line or if you get the ball killed on you, you had a, you know, five push ups or something like that. Right. And so like blockers are reaching as high as they can, trying to swap yeah. like push ups. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I love it. And it's practical too, because like if you're running a four, the later you can leave, the more effective it's gonna be. So, you know, you're finding your personal tempo. Like ah. and you know the players on the other side of the net. You know the blocker who's in front of you. So it's once again, like you get out of what you put into it but there's opportunities whenever you create drills with lots of different things going on. Well, we've gotten blown past our uh, <laughs> one hour time <laughs> constraint, but I want to ask uh, just you know a couple last questions. What's the future of LSU look like and the future of, of Russell Brock, if you'd like to speak in the third person? <laughs> sure, yeah. I think that, you know, once again, in speaking in generalities, hmm. you know, I think if you're in the sport and you're at, one of the better programs in the country, like your job is really to keep ticking off things that haven't been done yet. Hmm. And every year, you know, there's that opportunity and there are still some pretty big opportunities that are out there for us that, that we want to keep fighting for. So that's the kind of general as a program that I think is probably as legal as I can be as far as trying to accomplish things we haven't accomplished yet. Okay. Uh, personally for me, you know, when every season ends, you know, the question is, what can I do better? You know, how can I improve? Like understanding the game a little bit more, you know, being able to create an environment that's, you know, a little more uh, conducive to those quality relationships. So I have to understand my responsibility as a coach. And I think this is a great maybe message for the coaches that are out there watching. Like it's easy to get to the end of the year and understand what the players didn't do well that maybe compromised our ability to be great. It's a lot more productive for me to get to the end of the year as a coach and say, what's in within my control that limited our ability to be great and mm. to be able to have those tough internal conversations and be honest and figure out, okay, like I either need to know more, I need to be able to train more, I need to relate better, I need to, what are the things that can then help me help our players be more successful? Do you have any go-to books that you either recently read or you refer back to or podcasts or, or any programs or mentors that you lean on when you're looking. Cause you know, you're at the top of the game, like NCAA beach volleyball, that's top of the food chain. Yeah. So yeah. where does somebody like you go for advice, help open learning that we preach in, in our athletes? Yeah. I think that probably I would be maybe hypocritical to not say my first go-to and basically what I kind of base my life around is going to be the Bible. I think that uh, you got to experience Katie a little bit and I love having her around. Yeah. She sharpens me in, in great ways, but that's, I think that when you're talking about relationship, you're talking about culture, you're talking about leadership, you're talking about being a servant in all the positive ways. That's the very best template for all those things. So that's going to be where I'm going to resonate most and, and really rely on to kind of help problem solve and to some degree and to in the most important ways. But I also want to read like the book we're reading this summer is Billy Allen's new one like that. that the inner night. Yep. Yeah, so the inner night, we're going to kind of read through that and try and help understand how we can maybe be a little bit better as a group. So I think that there's always something going on like that. I'm not a big podcast listener, but I'll have to admit whenever we had the conversation, I started listening and I enjoyed it. 
So I'm going to continue to do that. I think one of the things recently that's been great for me is, and you've mentioned it a few times, is just getting involved with USA Beach and on the coaching side of things. I mean, getting to be around those coaches and to have conversations about volleyball, to have conversations about drills, to have conversations about technique. It's great because I think the wonderful thing about our sport is there are a lot of different ways to do it uh, like successfully. You know, you can literally in every facet, like early platform or late platform on first touch, you know? Wh- right. <laughs> that's that's like, decision like, am I going to keep my mind open offensively or am I going to limit my choices? Like it's, you could be on either end of the spectrum and be talking to people who are elite at what they do and incredibly successful. And they could literally tell you the exact opposite way to do the exact same skill. So I love that about our sport. I think it's a lot of fun to be involved in those conversations. And it's sometimes you got to pinch yourself, you know, when you're sitting at the table and you're trying to develop a game plan and you end up just talking about, well, how do you run a three? And how do you run a three? And just the nuance within the sport is great. So I think that that's probably for me, because I've re- only recently kind of started getting into that. It's been about last year and a half where I've started kind of doing some USA stuff. And that has been invigorating mentally and just from a learning perspective to really. And also, I will say, you know, having some of our players, our recent grads start to have some serious success internationally and domestically, just watching a lot more of because they're doing what we you know, have tried to do to see it at the next level is fun because you see it in a different way at a diff- on a different platform. And that's been really productive just to kind of continue to, to dig into what we do and how we do it. Have those players come back and told you anything that you're like, I remember when one of our players went to train with the U.S. national team. And when he came back, our coach asked him, hey, what are they teaching you that yeah. you can bring back to us? Yep. Uh, have you had any conversation with those from your from your former players that, that turned out to be really useful? Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, Tony Rodriguez tweaked her knee. And so she's mm-hmm. been back in town and she's working with our doctors and getting healthy and she'll be fine. But in the meantime, like she just hangs out, like she'll come up and do rehab and come and hang out in the office. And we t- and she's getting training from lots of different people out in California now. So once again, like we're talking about things that she's learning, like we know what she learned from us. But now we're talking about things that she's learning from other people and some of it she likes and some of it she doesn't. And so it, once again, it's just a growth process. And anytime you can get involved with anybody who's learning, like what they have to say is really valuable. I, I want to say, you know, John Hyden mentioned something that maybe in your opening clip about, you know, how anytime you can hear something from somebody else, you know, it, maybe it's productive or maybe you just take it and you throw it out, or maybe you kind of use it and tweak it so it's more applicable to you. So I think that that's a great mindset to have. Like we're, you can't go into a sport that is so fluid and be completely blocked off mentally that you're not willing to think maybe there's a better way. It doesn't mean you have to change it, but you have to at least consider why people are doing it a certain way, because maybe it can he- even help with your technique. Like we're not going to change our technique, but something that they're doing a different way can help us understand why maybe we need to tweak our technique a little bit, but not change it. Sure. Yeah. Or just hearing the way somebody defines that technique or an explanation of that and then reapplying it like, well, I'm not going to do that. But if I take a little slice of that, maybe I can change the way I contact the ball. And it's strange when a different, somebody else's path, when you can see it, it changes your path. You don't necessarily have to walk you know, the same path that they, that they did. But when you hear about it and you listen to the things that they've learned, you're like, huh, maybe I can take a glance at that too, without necessarily going down that same way. And you honestly, we'd be foolish not to use other people's experiences because the more collective experience that you understand, then the better you're going to be at, you know, decision-making and processing because there's just more information. So it makes the world go round, baby. That's right. <laughs> well, can't thank you enough for the longest podcast we've ever run. <laughs> hey, so there you go. Checked another thing off that list. <laughs> That's right. We PR'd. I appreciate that. <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity. It felt like it went pretty quickly. So it did. It did. And definitely, you know, way more to explore. 
but I don't know how many people have uh, two hour drives work to volleyball tournaments. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> We're it down for the published version. So. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any place that anybody should reach out to you, specific social media or an email or just anything that you want them to pay attention to any new projects or anything like that? Yeah, I got enough going on with what we've got going on. So I don't really, you know, invest too heavily in other areas. I mean, my social media, I think all of them are at Russ LSU. I can't remember. Yeah, we got it in the show notes. Yeah, so they can yeah, put it in the show notes. <laughs> They're all the same. And, you know, I, try, I know part of my job is I got to stay up to speed on that stuff. And, and I enjoy it. It's fun to kind of see what's going on and to have people, you know, reach out and uh, get involved with anybody who you can, who's old enough to actually interact with, because um, NCA limits that as well. Right. But other than that, I mean, we try and get out and do clinics at clubs around the country and we love, we're in the recruiting process. So, you know, you're always out there watching people play. And a lot of times you can't talk to anybody when you're out there, but it's fun to to say hi and wave and what's the and best way to reach out to you to get you for a clinic basically kind of going through clubs so because okay. the clubs will basically have i don't know john mentioned it that they're doing it as well like where they'll have college coaches come out and they'll do kind of college coach clinic hmm. and that's kind of the loophole for ncaa because camps and clinics are all completely regulated so whenever a club puts on a clinic and they open it up to Anybody who wants to join, then coaches who go to those clinics can interact and, and train and, and help people. We also host camps on our campus. We usually do. We had a couple this summer and we usually have one in the fall. So I think the website there is Tiger Beach Volleyball or tigercamps.org or something. that Maybe that'll be in the notes as well. <laughs> um, but we do host camp, camps on campus as well. And it's fun because we love our stadium. And anybody. How cool would that be? It's, it's ridiculous. Can I sign up? You got space for 36 year old. Hey, <laughs> let me know. We'll figure it out. That'd be awesome. I'd love to come to yeah. the campus to see what it looks like. It's great. It's a lot yeah. of fun. Cool. Well, coach Brock Russell, I really, really appreciate your time. Thanks for your knowledge and, and for sharing it with all of us. And yeah, I'd love to have you on again, talk to you and then see you on the road and, and heck yeah, maybe visit, visit LSU, have a, have a gander. Definitely. Let me know. I, I would absolutely, anytime you need, you run out of people to chat with, just give me a buzz and we can catch up again. For Sounds sure. good to me. You're going to regret you said that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You have a great day. I'll do my closing notes now, but uh, you're off the hook. Thank you so much. Right. Hey, you're welcome. Thank you. All right. Have a good one. Guys, what a seriously awesome talk. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. The things I got out of it, creating culture, you know, active people talk about culture so much, things that we can do, how can we do it, why it's important. But, you know, so many of the answers that I guess I've gotten in my career are vague. Where say, you know, you really need to develop culture. Okay. But I actually need a how, you know, and I like some of the drills. Uh, I think some people call it maybe a hot potato. Coach called it drop the baby. That's a good one. And then we touched on being able to talk about vulnerability, what your players see you as and, and what your teammates see you as. And it's a difficult conversation to open up for yourself. It's a difficult conversation to maybe like expose yourself to criticism, but a lot of times it turns into exposing yourself to compliments and seeing what you do well. And sometimes it surprises you the things that you do well, and it surprises you that people notice it. It takes a lot for people to reach out and be complimentary, but as coaches, and as partners, volleyball players, as humans, if you guys can create opportunities for people to be honest with you and use really good, specific questions, not general. You know, when I ask my partners, hey, what was the worst part about playing with me? I think that that's a better question than, let's say, what was it like playing with me? You know, you have to dive into something specific. And I, I think we got into some specifics during this episode and really, really got to learn about transitioning between indoor. We touched a little bit on the technique. So I'm excited and I'd like to get some messages from you guys if we should have Russell Brock back on the episode and what you want to, well, I know we're going to have him back, but what you guys actually really want to hear from him. So shoot me some comments, DM, social media, email, support at better at beach.com. And let's 
start framing some questions. I have questions that I use as kind of a guiding light to do these interviews, but I want to know specifically what questions you guys want me to ask what guests. And maybe I can start sharing with you a list of my upcoming guests so that you guys know who we're talking to so you can ask them more. There is a good place for Pepper and there is a bad place for Pepper. <laughs> and it's all in how you treat it and you need usually need an agreement from your partner to say, is it okay if I challenge you here? People get very ornery about their pepper time. So if you want to get better, if you want to get sweaty, there's a way to really improve your game through pepper. I think serve receive is going to be more valuable, but that's more valuable for serve receive. If you're the type of person who likes to pepper, but you get mad when somebody doesn't hit directly at your forearm so that you can easily control it. I'll tell you, you need to upgrade your defense. You should pepper unexpectedly all around, just like the, the, the match is. It's unexpected. You need to teach yourself how to react. So uh, pepper ugly, pepper out of control, make somebody dive, tap them in the goggles, see if you can, you know, just not knock their sunglasses off, but misplace them a little bit on their face. <laughs> and I think your game will improve because of it. If you guys are here live still, and there are 14 of you, just know the early bird for the first week of camps in October, October 30th, we have our first camp. Uh, it is not yet sold out, but we sold out almost half of it in 16 hours so we had 26 spots out of 60 sold out in 16 hours and that will not be our most popular date so that means that the upcoming camps for sure you want to jump on and if you want the chance at that we do a tiered system where we release it to our complete player program members then we release it to our email list then we release it to social media and our website so that our alumni and the people that follow along you know, they get first crack at it. Would love to see you at one of those camps in Florida. And if you're looking for practice plans, online courses, or you just want to chat, we're here. So hope you guys have a great day. Hope you enjoyed the episode as much as I did. And for sure, reach out if you have specific questions or anybody who you definitely think we should bring on. That's all from me. Guys, have a great day, and I will see you on the sand. <laughs>